think that's where a lot of people go go bad with a pup. They throw them in a pen and just throw feed to them every day. And to me, you got to make a connection with them. Some guys don't agree with me on that, but I think you got to have a good bond with a dog. It's real simple, I think, with a pup, and a lot of people don't understand it. When a pup is ready to start, it will start. You can't force a pup to start, and you can't force a pup to treat. It has to do it on its own. Hello and welcome to the Stark Outdoors Podcast. I'm your host, Clayton Stark, and today's episode is going to be with Eric Emery. And for those of you not familiar with Eric Emery, you may have seen him on my YouTube channel when I went hunting with him and that English coon hound, Big Lee. And Big Lee is actually owned by Chris Harley. And I met Eric at the Tournament of Champions last year. He was there with J.R. Gray, and I got to meet all those guys on the final cast. And of course, on that final cast, J.R. Gray won with Willie's Connor McGregor. And we actually sat down and recorded this podcast before the Grand American, which is pretty cool because... Chris Harley, the man that owns Big Lee, ended up winning the Grand American, and I interviewed him last year at Autumn Oaks, and he said that that was a goal of his. He's been really close for the past few years of winning it, and he actually won this last year, so I'd just like to say congratulations to him and his family. But before we get into that interview, I'll just give you a brief update on kind of what I've been doing lately. If you follow me on Facebook and YouTube and stuff, you'll probably have already known what I've been up to, but... This last week, I got together and went hunting with the Dunlap family, which the Dunlaps, they've been coon hunting for a very long time. When I say the Dunlaps, I mean Don, Chuck, and Colton Dunlap. And between the three of them, they have eight world championships. And they're really great people, and I got together with them, and we sat down and recorded a podcast before it got dark. And then once it got dark, of course, we went outside and turned some dogs loose. And I wasn't really sure what I was going to be getting into because it was super cold and the wind picked up when I got there and it was snowing and kind of icy and muddy out. But we ended up looking at seven coon and their dogs did really well so I'm excited to share that video with you guys. And then the next morning after that night I went on my way home and stopped at the Jukebox Kennels place. They're putting on their annual meat hunt and I interviewed Chuck Gallardo and then I went hunting with his son Mark Gallardo. And of course we sat down and recorded a podcast to get some of the history behind some of the Jukebox dogs. And then we uh, went to the woods and... We treat a couple squirrels. It uh, it was pretty crazy, to be honest. They have a few woods they save back just for this meat hunt. And I'll just let you know, since we did that podcast before we went hunting, we didn't really get turned loose until close to 10 o'clock. And between 10 o'clock and about 1 p.m., we treed 18 squirrels. So that will be a very, very good video. Whether you coon hunt or squirrel hunt, the dog work and the history is really great and i know you'll really enjoy that one too and of course if you've also been following me you'll have known i've been hunting that fogger pup for a little bit now and he was doing really good and virtual came and got him and he's been hunting him and he's looking pretty good and i know i post about it all the time and a lot of you have probably already heard it but there might be some new people out there listening to this so if there is i'll just leave a little audio clip here so you can get an idea what this pup sounds like and remember this pup is 11 months old cut him loose Went about 300 yards in there. Went in about 50 yards and made a straight right hand turn with about 250 and just blew up on a tree. So we'll go in there and see if he has anything. Good boy. And since Bertrell got that pup back, I'm going to be hunting a female for him named Widowmaker. He got her to breed a frogger once she comes in, but she's off of J.R. Gray's two-time world champion, Gray's Rackham Willie, and then a Zeb 3 female. And she's a gorgeous dog, and I look forward to hunting her and bringing you guys videos of her in the woods. And that's just kind of what I've been up to. And one last thing before I get into the interview, just to give you guys an idea of what the scheduling looks like, the Dunlap Houndsman Spotlight Series featuring Chuck, Don, and Colton Dunlap. The video on YouTube goes live January 22nd at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. And then the podcast for the Dunlap family goes live at 6 a.m. on Monday, January 23rd. And then the Houndsman Spotlight for the Jukebox Kennels, that video premieres January 29th at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. And the Jukebox Kennels podcast premieres Monday, January 30th at 6 a.m. So I hope you're looking forward to that, and I won't hold you guys up any longer. So here's this week's episode with Eric Emery. All right. Well, I'm sitting here with Eric Emery. You want to 
just introduce yourself a little bit. Tell us kind of how you got into it. Uh, yeah, I'm Eric Emery. I'm from northwestern Indiana. Uh, pour concrete for a living. Coming around a little bit. Uh, been hunt hunting about as long as I've known. My uncles got me and my brothers and some of my buddies into it. It kind of took off from there. We never did a whole bunch of competition hunting. It was more just hide hunting, pleasure hunting. That's what we lived for. Do you remember the first dog you hunted with? Yeah. Uh, first dog was a female my uncle had. She was a night champion. They called her Tim's Little Jazz. She'd be a, the grandmother to the Uncle Cracker dog that Darren had on here the other day. She was a red and white female. And uh, she was off of Cows' Big River JJ, which was out at 92 World Champion Jesse. And that was the first one that, uh, a good one, I should say, I hunted with. Yeah. So is that what you started with for the most part, or just English dogs? That's all I ever knew, buddy. So that, that line of dogs, was that your uncle's line of dogs then, or was that just a dog uh, he had? He bred his females to Rory Cows' line. And that's kind of, I wouldn't say it was our line, you know, but that's what we hunted was his, his line of English dogs, Boyd's Little Joe, Tap Breeding. Okay. And then like that, my uncle would always keep a female and he would breed to whatever stud Rory had. And that's kind of what we went with with them pups. That's interesting. That's why I like talking about stuff like this because you, you can kind of get an idea of like when you're reading bloodlines and pedigrees and stuff like that, of like where the dogs come from, but it's different when you get to talk to people about that actually been in the woods with them and kind of the history behind it, some of the more details. Right. Yeah, it was, it's, it's been a uh, 360 since them days, you know, hunt walker dogs mainly now, but <laughs> I mean, I, I ain't colorblind. I still, if, if it's pink and it's a coon tree, I ain't a parts to it, you know? Yeah, I'm the same way. That's uh, the way I am. You know, the name of the game is tree and raccoon, not what color your dog is. And I think if more people would open their eyes to that, there would be a lot more better dogs. Yeah, there's a lot of people that put more, way too much stock in the breed of the dog. I mean, I understand you might, some people might have certain breeds that, that kind of fits their personality maybe more, kind of what they grew up around. But right. just to be completely closed-minded and not, be willing to hunt another it's just you're screwing yourself out of a lot of opportunities i think right and you know that's a lot of things kind of the way we was brought up i don't know if it's for other people but if you didn't hunt an english dog i mean nevertheless they were prejudiced <laughs> yeah. you know there, there there was no such thing as a good walker or a good black and tan and then when we got a little age to us and started hunting and seeing for ourselves you know it's like a wake up like come on guys there ain't this many people hunting walker dogs and they're all bad <laughs> you know what i mean <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, i understand why people get upset because walkers obviously they win the most competition hunts i mean it's not even really close as far as the dogs performing at the top level but people like to point out like some negative traits walkers might have but <laughs> they obviously like they tree coon there's a reason why they're so consistent, and then a lot of people like to say that, well, walkers win so much because there's so many of them. Well, then why are so many people deciding to hunt walkers then if they're so bad? Right. They're not breeding and hunting them every day because they're bad. I mean, look at your pro hound cover every month, and you'll, you'll see what's going on. And I, like I said, I, I will hunt literally anything as long as it acts the way I, I like and trees coon consistently. I don't care what it is. That's, a, that's the way everybody should be, my opinion. So you started with English dogs. When when was your first time kind of branching out to a different breed? First time I really branched out, uh, there's a guy about an hour from me by the name of Jason Cooper, and we would always pleasure hunt. And he had a female called Too Many Secrets. I don't, some people probably remember her. She got third in the world hunt, or fourth maybe. I'm not sure what year it was. But Jason was working out of town a bunch, and he asked me to hunt her. And uh, that was probably the first walker dog that I got behind. And she went on to be very successful. She's been in the Grand 16, Final World, doubled up at the PKC World. So, I mean, I couldn't list all the hunts she's won, but that was kind of the first one. 
but it was like I, it wasn't a handling job or anything. I was just helping a buddy out, you know. Yeah. And then from there on, I think I was at Walker Days. I met Tyler Stewart. I don't remember the year, but that's who kind of I wouldn't say took me under his wing, but there for a couple of years I stayed at Tyler's house Thursday to Sunday every weekend coon hunting. And he kind of showed me a lot about handling and preparation as far as dogs go. And that he was a good guidance for me. And we, we had a lot of good times and he showed me a lot of tricks. So did you competition hunt when you like at first, when you had English dogs at all, or did you, not- uh, we would fiddle around a little bit in your local UKC hunts, but nothing major, you know? All right. I, I want, just wondered. If, we title them dogs out, you know, make them a grand night or something. But as far as, you know, driving two hours from the house, none of that happened. Yeah. Back then, though, too, I don't think that wasn't as common as it is now. Like, we're now, it's, there's a big hunt, some like, every night of the week almost. Right. That aspect of coon hunting, I think, has grown as far as the level of competition being, like, higher payouts and right. bigger prizes and definitely more frequent. Yeah, that's there's no way around that. You know, that time Tyler was hunting Bushwhacker and Shane didn't look too far. He always had tank and then Steve had big country time. Everybody called him Bo. You know, I was I I grew up with them dogs, you know. Everybody knows their names now and I'm thinking, Well, hell, I'm just, you know, out hunting with these guys learning stuff. And then they go on to be so successful, and I never thought nothing about it. You know what I mean? I just thought we was pleasure hunting, having a good time. Yeah. And then, I mean, just like I said, with them three guys, named Randy Gad used to come up all the time and hunt with us. I mean, there was a bunch of guys there that treated me the same as the rest of them. And you look back on it, like, damn, they didn't have to do that. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's one thing I have noticed since I've started doing this. The, The people that, like, actually agree to hunt, and have me over and we get together to hunt like it doesn't matter if they've just won a few hunts or if they've won world championships and are some of the like most well-known people and i I don't mean just with walkers either i mean like with any breed they're just regular guys that they honestly care about the sport and just making memories like people like to talk about how like i think they'll ask if you're a pleasure hunter or a competition hunter but to me you're all just coon hunters like all, all competition hunters pleasure hunt unless they're at a competition hunt. Like if they didn't enjoy pleasure yeah. hunting because they're not, they're not doing it for hides. The hides ain't worth money. You know what I mean? Like that's, that's what I tell everybody. If there wasn't ever a competition hunt again, as long as I live, I promise you dark, we're turning a hound loose. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's just the way it is. Yeah. And that's, I'm, I'm sure there are some people out there that might not, be into it as much if competition hunts didn't exist but for the most part i I still think the backbone of what coon hunting is is just getting together with your buddies at dark and going and turning your dogs loose and just telling stories and making memories i think getting away from your wife and not worrying about work (laughs) yeah Yeah. (laughs) we have fun though i mean if you can't have fun we ain't gonna do it the way i look at it that's what it's about yeah there's a time to be serious and get right. And everybody knows when that is. But at the end of the day, like you said, if we can't enjoy ourselves, it's time to quit. Yeah. And I, that's one trait I think I've noticed amongst people that have been doing it for a while. Cause I, if you don't have that mindset, I think you'll get burned out doing it. If you think you have to go a hundred percent balls to the wall and just win everything. If you're a competition hunter, I think if you have that mentality, you're going to lose interest quick. Yeah. Uh, that's like anything, but you're going to lose eventually. And if that one lose breaks your day, you might as well find a different hobby. I can promise you that. <laughs> Especially when you're not, not the one actually out there on the field or in the ring doing something yourself. You're, you're relying on a dog to perform for you. <laughs> Got a mind of their own. Yeah. You never know. Nope. For sure. Like around what age were you when you got together with those guys and started getting more serious? Uh, I, was, I was fresh out of high school, so I'm going to say about 19. 18, 19. What were some of the biggest things you've learned from them as far as in the competition aspect? Will to prepare. If you ain't ready to go, why go? You know what I mean? You got to know when to stay home and when to go. And a lot of people think, well, I hunted one night this week. I'm going to go win this hunt this weekend. And it don't work like that. (laughs) 
I mean, it, it goes back to race horses, sporting chickens, anything, athletes. If you if you're not practicing and getting ready, you're wasting your time, in my opinion. Yeah. And I think a lot of people weigh that out. Well, you know, old Blue treat a couple this week. He's looking all right. Well, <laughs> hour and a half later in that cast, when mine's set in there deep, old Blue's going to be, you know what I mean? Just yeah. So many variables that you can put into it as far as preparation, I think, is the number one key. Yeah, and if, if that's what your competition's doing, if your competition is preparing at a certain level and you're not, then you're just going to be at a disadvantage. The other other dogs are going to just be in better shape and used to – that aspect right. that's kind of what i learned you know I, I remember going up there hunting with tyler my dog had long toenails he'd be like boy you ain't been hunting i said oh you know he's look at your dog damn toenails I'm like, man this guy's sharp you know just stuff like that you can pay attention to you know but i mean it's just it's uh you know just paying attention you know with anything with any animal they'll, they'll tell on themselves you, yeah you know what i mean yeah that's and when they're not feeling good or anything if you just pay attention to your animal and the, like I said, they'll, they'll work with you. Yeah. What about, let's talk about shift away from competition a little bit. What about, uh, starting dogs? You have like, do you get puppies very often or just kind of get started dogs or, uh, I usually do not mess with puppies. If we have a litter of pups, my brother, Steve would do that. Once okay. we're running training, then we'll go from there. I just, I should say I don't have the patience, but, I don't have the patience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I understand. It, it, and it seems the best way to get them started anyways, from my experience and talking to other people, is just letting them run loose and develop naturally on their own anyways. Right. So I think it's like we talked about earlier. I mean, it's just time and, you know, you got to you gotta give them a chance. Yeah. If someone has an, a, like a place where they can just be out hunting just like all the time when they're really little, then I think that really helps progress them. And then if they start doing stuff on their own, you can single them out. Or do you ever take a pup hunting with another dog? Uh, yeah, we have. You know, when we're first starting, and you know they don't know much and stuff, we'll, we'll, we'll take them with old dogs. And then at, at what point do you single them out? Uh, usually once they start split treeing, you know, and I know the whole pressure – or if they're treeing ahead of the old dogs, you know, you, like I said earlier, they'll about tell on themselves. You know when they're ready. <laughs> do you mess much with drags or hang ups or anything like that? Buddy, I don't do any of that. You're talking to the wrong Emory brother. I'm not asking <laughs> that. I'd like to tell you I do, but I ain't going to lie to you. <laughs> well, there's nothing wrong with that because they, they do get very frustrating because 99% of them takes, <laughs> takes some good, long, hard work to get them go in the right direction then there's like that one percent that are just natural and those ones are very rare right that's for sure you either have to be really lucky and be able to get that one percent often or have a lot of money to where you can buy that one percent yeah <laughs> and no i don't i don't have either so i just have to I can say work I'm hard both of them <laughs> yeah so i just have to hope and pray i get one and put a bunch of time into it <laughs> That's a fact, bro. After your early 20s, kind of go from there as far as competition hunting, some of the people maybe or some of your experiences. Well, when I was over there hunting with Tick all the time, Duel Murphy used to come up and hunt with us quite a bit because they don't live too far apart. And me and Duel hooked up. I mean, hell, I talked to him every day. And he had Piper at the time. And about that time, Melvin, they just purchased Melvin. So Duel wasn't hunting both of them. So, uh, I didn't have a dog and he, we kind of hooked up on Piper and that's kind of where I went for about a year. That's all I hunted. And, uh, I didn't really go to a whole bunch of hunts with her cause with my job and stuff, I can't, but that, that's probably my, my favorite dog that I've ever had here. And I've had a handful of them and she was, uh, she's really good to me, buddy. So did you competition hunter then? Is that what you're getting at? Yeah. Yeah, uh, some. we hunt her. Yeah, some. But I got her in the, the year we won Walker Days. I got her in the finals. And then Duel won the hunter in the final cast. And, you know, he hits his dog. He raised her as a pup. He made it right with me. So I'm like, man, what am I out? You know what I mean? Yeah. So it worked out. We won that. Then we got her qualified for the TOC. 
that's kind of a funny story too. The TOC, I had Connor at my house that whole season. I was hunting him, the Connor McGregor that won the TOC that year. And uh, I was hunting him for JR and Duel ended up going to Texas. And uh, he said, hey, can you care to keep Piper for a little bit? I said, no, that's fine, you know. And he got in that accident or whatever. So I had Piper all spring and I was hunting Piper and Connor together all <laughs> kill season. And a lot of people don't know that, but you know, that heads up match and oh, this is gonna be a headache. I've done this a hundred times. You know what I mean? Just yeah. laughing back of my head. But yeah, that's them are the two I was hunting there for a while. And then when all that happened, they both got first and second, man. That was that was awesome to see. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I'm sure most people didn't know that either. Yeah. Yeah, that's um, that's pretty cool. They stayed all winter with me. (laughs) A lot of nice with them. You know, doing what I do, it's really important that I have high quality equipment that's really dependable and long lasting because I am on the road a lot and I hunt in very different conditions and terrains. Could be in the summertime, could be in the wintertime, could be in the mountains, or it could be in flat country. So I'd like to thank my sponsors for all their help making this possible and for all their quality equipment. I'd like to thank Dogtra and the Dogtra tracking systems and the Pathfinder, Big Dog Lights, and my favorite light with them is the Big Dog Blitz, and the Genesis and Genesis Plus are great also, and I've used them for many years. Gun Dog House Doors, because especially in the wintertime, keeping your dogs out of the elements is extremely important. So for long-lasting, high-quality doors for your kennels, check out Gun Dog House Doors. But in the summertime, we have different issues to deal with, like a lot of thick leaves on the trees. So if you want something that'll help you see eyes at night, make sure you check out Bayou Legacy Game Calls with the Tree Shaker Coon Squaller. For high-quality coon hunting clothing, make sure you check out Coon Dog Wear. I'd also like to thank Conkeys Outdoors Hound and Hunting Supply, Ringtails and Tall Tails Hunting Supply and Taxidermy, Bill Shinniger and Saddle Up Cryo. I'd also like to thank Coon Hunter Supply and Razor Hunting Gear. We all love good coon hounds, and if you've been doing this for a while, you'll know how important having a good bloodline is. So when picking a new dog, make sure you keep these stud dogs in mind. World Champion, Platinum Champion, Davis's Rosedale Frogger, Grand Knight Champion, Saddle Up Lazarus, UKC Grand Knight Champion 2, PKC Gold Champion, Backwater Bobo, and PKC Gold Champion, UKC Dual Grand Champion, Buck Creek Croson. And remember, since this is just a podcast, if you want to see the dogs in action, see what they look like, what they sound like, meet their owners, make sure you check out my YouTube channel where you can see all of them dogs in action. Where you're at, it's very similar hunting-wise to where I live, and it's it's pretty nice hunting. There's a reason why there's so many dogs, quality people and quality dogs around Ohio, Indiana, Kentucky, Michigan, like this area. There's, it's just, it's a lot of, a lot of coon, but it's not always like that either. So they, they have to work at times and other times they can kind of ambush them. So they get, they get experience doing both. You get the hot summer months and then you get brutal cold winter. So they get, they get a good look. Right. That's the thing. Where like in the winter time I'm laid off from work and I about have to keep two dogs because I get too bored. I'll hunt all night, all winter, and you you'll just hunt one into the ground. You can't do that. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's nice to have two of them that way I can rotate. You know, when this one's feeling good, I'll hunt him or vice versa. You know. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of people, you know, kind of forget about that. You you don't have to hunt one seven nights a week and just bury them into the ground. And <laughs> no. you're, you're you're wasting your time and your dog's time. And that's kind of my fault, you know, like I said, with me being off work, man, I want to coon hunt. I've thought about this all summer, you know, <laughs> and, uh, that's why it's good to have two around. I think. Yeah. I always have at least two and that's <laughs> by two. I mean, too many. That's how many I have. <laughs> yeah. There you go. <laughs> no, I usually have a couple good ones and then a bunch of young or mediocre dogs. Right. And then I, you know, I hunt with my brother and Jade Lovins, me and him own a female together. And I mean, we, we got enough dogs to go around. I shouldn't say that, but you know what I mean? It's just, right. you, you got to know when to go and when to stay home. Just like we talked about earlier with the competition hunts. I mean, you can do more bad than you can good. In my yeah. Opinion. That's very true. That we, I, I think it was on Steve Fielder's podcast. We talked about that a little bit as far as young dogs getting put in competition hunts. Have you, have you had any experience putting really young dogs in hunts? Yeah, uh, yeah, somewhat. I mean, that, I mean that goes back earlier. You got to know what you got. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, 
then young, them young dogs tell on yourself. And if you put them in situations, you know, to be successful, like I like to keep them out of hunt. I mean, what's what's what do you got to prove if Billy made a night champion at a year old? Whoop de do. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's cool, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah, you can you can brag about your your young dog winning. As, until it's not a young dog anymore, and then right. that kind of wears then, off. You know, Billy's a slick tree and alligator at a three-year-old. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. And I think people just look a little common sense and hunt and anything in life can kind of take you a far away. But I think people kind of let it get the best of them sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, at the end of the day, like me and you were talking, a dog has a mind of its own. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then you put it in a cast with three other dogs with minds of their own. You don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> You just failure, in my opinion. Yeah, you might look good on a couple of coons, but how many of them bad habits is he going to pick up? Yeah, you know. Yeah, that's. I when they're young, it's they're so impressionable to like. That's you just got to be careful with them. That's why I like hunting them by themselves once they're starting to come on because you can control it a lot more, in my opinion. Yeah, that's absolutely it. You can go out when the weather's right or the situation's right. You don't have to, well, the hunt's tonight. We got to go tonight when you know it's not going to be a good night. And then maybe expose it to junky dogs or put them on top of a deer or possum that he wouldn't have been, been around. Absolutely. Or when it's 12 <laughs> degrees out and we're out for five hours. Man, how many hunts you go to and it's 12 degrees? Yeah. Come on now. Yeah. You know what I mean? but yeah. <laughs> that's just like i said you know a little common sense take you a little ways in life yeah I th that's most people i think have that but there's some people i think they get way too much they get their ego into it way too much to where they're they want that satisfaction of the win for themselves more than actually developing the dog i think is what it comes down to yeah that's a fact so i assume <laughs> I'm talking to you right now. I assume you're not going to the Grand American. I'm not going to make it. <laughs> That's, have you ever been down there? I have not. That's I haven't either. I've had a ton of people ask me if I was going to be there. So, well, I'd like to, but <laughs> it's like a 13-hour drive. That's. <sighs> I plan on going back to Winter Classic. I went there last year. It was my first time, and, man, that was good. I really enjoyed it. How does that compare to Autumn Oaks? Uh... Well, it's a lot cooler for one. That was nice, but <laughs> it, it was a beautiful setup. Uh, had a really good guide. JR had a good guide for us. And, uh, I can't complain, man. I had a really good hunt, drew a really good cast, and enjoyed myself. What dog were you hunting? I had I hunted Connor down there last year. Okay. Yeah, we doubled up both nights, and he looked pretty good. How did you come to meet JR? Uh, that's a funny story. When I was hunting <laughs> with Duel. Him and Levi were partners on some dogs, and Levi and JR are partners on Old Willie. And I always teased Levi. I said, man, I'm going to breed a female to that dog. And he said, well, just tell JR to put it on my tab and he'll be <laughs> taken care of. And we always laughed about it, but I, I couldn't took it to heart. I called Le uh, JR. I said, hey, man, I got a dog. And he, Levi said, put it on his tab. I'll be down there. What? You know what I mean? He kind of <laughs> caught him off guard. He didn't even know who I was. And then – uh we end up breeding a bitch to him, and uh, after that, I mean, we just, he's one of my best friends. Do you remember how long ago that was? Uh, I'm going to say that was about three years ago. All right, I just wondered, because I met met all of you at once at that, I think it was, it was a tournament of champions it was the first time I met you, wasn't it? Yeah, yep. So, I think JR come up for Walker Days the year Piper won it, and we was hunting quite a bit there for a little bit, and then... I think after that Walker days in May is usually a pretty good month in Indiana to run for a truck ticket. And uh, he ended up leaving Connor with me after Walker days. And we missed a freaking truck ticket by like a $2 and 25 cents or something <laughs> crazy, but we had a really good month. And then after that, I mean, heck I talked to him every day. It just long lost brother. He's a good one. And he sold Connor. What is what does he have now that he's hunting? Uh, well, he owns Scar, but she's up here right now, doing a little boot camp. Um, then he owns the pet dog with Steve, my brother, and then uh, they got a female called Hooker. 
that he's hunting right now. And are those, are they litter mates? Uh, no, uh, Peck would be a litter mate to Connor. He's off of Nick's Abbey female. And then Scar is off of Lane Denny's Emmy female that won the world hunt and truck. And I'd be lying like if I told you Hooker's mom, I ain't got a clue. <laughs> is that is that out of Willie though? Yeah, she's off of Willie. That's what I figured. So do you have any hunts you're going to be going to anytime soon? Yeah, we got a, it's getting busy pretty soon. We got the tournament of champions coming up. And then uh, Scar hunts the spring two-year-olds, super stakes. Um, try to get qualified for the world and winter classics coming up. Yeah, there's a bunch. I just wasn't sure how much you're going to be traveling to those. But, yeah, yeah that's. Uh, February's pretty slow. Uh, wait, I don't know. Is winter classic in February or March? I can't remember. I it think, might be the. I think, I think after February, it's pretty. There's a hunt every weekend. Yeah, I know. I know for sure. April is very busy. Uh, gets crazy. Yeah. Tournament champions and Walker days and right. all sorts of stuff. Yeah, we're gonna try it. We uh we got lucky and won the pup extravaganza last spring with Scar and was successful with that. And like I said, the TOC. He did real good. But. Is she qualified for the DOC? Yep, she's qualified. How I get, how many of those dogs, are they all qualified for the DOC? Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure. I mean, I can't swear for it, but yeah, I know the three that I just named are, and then there's a couple handful more that, yeah, I think we're all qualified. I figured, but I just figured I'd check too. Hopefully the weather and everything works out like it did last year because – other than the wind on that final cast, that for this this time of year, it was it was pretty good. Couldn't ask for no better, in my opinion. Yeah, the, I mean there was it, up until about the end of the cast, it felt like we just in both rounds we just walked nonstop, like there was just a dog <laughs> treat somewhere. Yeah, it was it was definitely we got our steps in. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah, hopefully we can have another good year like that. You just never know. Do you have any, uh, any other plans for any English dogs coming up, or are you just sticking with Walker? I, I, I don't know. Like I said earlier, I ain't, I ain't colorblind. I ain't racist, but it's just so hard. You know what I mean? Yeah. You get used to a certain style. And, you know, I ain't seen all the English dogs. Don't got it, but it just seems like the Walkers have done better for me. That's just a personal opinion, you know? Yeah. I'd like to see some other dogs besides Walker's do some winning absolutely i would love to see that and i don't mean obviously there there's the ones out there winning but i like i'd like to see something win like a world hunt or something big is what i'd like that's, to see that's how i am man i we'll all be together hunting and there'll be an english or a red bone in the finals and i said man i hope that guy wins they say you know him i said no but i hope the off color dog win yeah and they all laugh at me but i don't know it's just the way i am and I don't have anything against walkers either, but like it, it would just be nice to see, because I mean, there's a lot of diehard people that hunt other breeds besides walkers. I'd like to see them have that type of success. Like I said, obviously they win at breed hunts and their local hunts and stuff, but I want to see something win a world hunt or something, just shock the world, win something big. Absolutely. No, that's the same thing we talked about earlier. How many years and, you know, nights of people hunted and, just catch that break. It would be nice for them, you know? Yeah. Yeah, because um, they put in the same amount of work as everyone else. That's a fact. And spend ungodly amounts of money just like everyone else do. Absolutely. Pretty much, is there anything with you or your life that we didn't really touch on as far as coon hunting-wise? Uh, no, I mean, not a whole lot. Uh, like I said earlier, you know, if I never went to a competition hunt again, it would hurt my feelings. I just like to coon hunt, you know? Yeah. And uh, I think that's what, I shouldn't say made us successful, but like I said earlier, to, just to drive to want to go hunting, and that's kind of where I am. You know, when I pop that snap, I want my dog to have one thing on his mind. I want him to treat coons, you know? I don't want him worried about your dog, worried about me shotgun. I just coon, you know what I mean? You got to have yeah. that on your mind, my opinion. Yeah, I, I've said that a few times recently about dogs that I've hunted with. Like I think it was in that podcast, one of the podcasts I was on talking about Frogger. That was one of the things I really liked about him when I've seen him go. He didn't, 
he didn't have anything else on his mind other than running as fast as he can the entire time he's cut loose until he is underneath a coon and then he's blowing the top out of the tree. Absolutely. That's what we're all after. They might just not admit it. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, everyone, like... At the end of the day, you know, if they take away strike or they lower the tree points or however they want to do it, the dog that trees the most coons is going to win the calf. Yeah. I mean, there's no way around that. Yeah. Everyone wants a deep and lonely dog, but it, I just want the dog that trees the most coon the quickest and doesn't make mistakes. That's what I would that's, want. That's the winner. I don't care where you go. You know, from Texas to Indiana, if you tree three more than the rest of the cast, guess who wins? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it goes back to common sense. And any more, like, I haven't been in the woods with just about any dog of any breed that worries about, like, covering dogs that much. Right. And I don't mean, like, just regular some guy down the street. I mean, like, people that competition on quite a bit. Their dogs are usually pretty naturally independent anyways. Yeah. So, like, that, sh- that shouldn't be... I mean, obviously, that should be a trait that if you want, you should want it, but that shouldn't be super high up on your list because that's anymore. That's kind of the only people breeding dogs right now are competition hunters, so they're not going to breed dogs that are not independent. Well, that's like kind of what I went back earlier. You know, if that dog's worried about you beating and stomping and shocking, and he ain't worried about training a coon, he's worried about getting away from you. You know what I mean? Just yeah. because they're eight tenths and three seconds treed with a coon, that dog didn't hunt that. Come on, man. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, it looks flashy. It looks good. But, you know, when coons ain't moving, and you, then what? You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, you're treed three miles out of pocket. Well, that's going to win you a bunch. You ain't <laughs> ever going to hear him. Yeah, say so that if the wind's blowing in the wrong direction <laughs> or or if it doesn't have a world-class mouth, then you're just you're screwed. You're you're training a, a dead horse. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. just, and I shouldn't say that. I like when to move around and hustle as good as anybody right. alive. But you got to be participating if you're hustling, if that makes any sense. Yeah. And, and I don't care what anyone says. If they had, if the dog they're handling or hunting, they turn it loose and it runs as hard as it can and goes in there and strikes and trees a coon quicker than the other dogs in the cast consistently they're going to like it. <laughs> I know. Absolutely. It doesn't matter if it's the trees one at 20 yards or two miles. If it, if it trees it faster and more consistently than the other dogs, that's, I think that's <laughs> going to be what everyone's looking for. It's what we're all after. <laughs> yeah. Now I got, that, that stuff just never impressed me. You know how far this one is. Now that, that's, that's cool, but you shouldn't have to do that. I mean, we coon hunt, you, you know, there's coons, Flip your light up in the trees. You're gonna to walk to two. Yeah. Right? Especially you know if if it's a good night and they're you know they're moving good and they're doing that. That I don't. That's why I really don't like it. If this time of year, if there's like ice and snow on the ground and they're just not you moving at do all, it usually. then that's different. <laughs> like if if they're just going until they find actually find a track, and then they are they're hunting the entire time. That's different. If you live in this area. It's it's dangerous to do that because there's not timber big enough for a dog to do that without crossing a few roads. Right, that, that's absolutely. And I, I don't mean to say that the wrong way. I like I said earlier, man. I like a dog to go hunting as good as anybody. My stuff's gonna go hunting, but you know what I'm saying, right? I mean, let's let's go hunt. Let's not go for a jog. You yeah. Know what I mean? For most people that have been coon hunting or squirrel hunting or anything for any amount of time, obviously we're not saying that you want a dog that kind of just hangs around and you got to kind of like walk it through the woods. Absolutely. <laughs> you, you, cold. Yeah. You want a dog that you turn loose and it runs just as hard and fast as the one that goes two miles. But if it comes across a coon before that two miles, it's going to tree it. Right. <laughs> you can give a hundred percent and tree something close and give a hundred percent tree something far away too. If I turn loose in a section and there's eight coons in a section, I want you to tree all eight. The way I always looked at it, if we're going to tree the one in the back of the woods, I'd have pulled back there and turned loose. Yeah. I mean, that goes back to common sense. But, you know, different training and people like different things. I'm not knocking it, saying it's a bad thing. No. I'm just thinking it, it, I don't know. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. 
it's just different strokes for different folks. Yeah, because, I mean, if we're talking competition hunting-wise, you get points based off of strike and treeing a coon. You don't get points based off of the distance the dog covered to do that. That's it, buddy. <laughs> so I just want that dog to put the most points on the paper as quickly as possible and make sure it's more than the other dogs in the cast. Right. If I, that, I mean, that's the same for pleasure hunters, coon hunters, hide hunters. If if we're hunting, the name of the game is to tree the most coons. Yeah. I mean, that. if, if, if you know, if these hunts – went away tomorrow and no one ever competition hunted again them three mile dogs would cease to exist seriously think about it yeah no nope. why would you walk three miles to one tree when we just passed up five walking to you yeah them dogs would cease to exist from coon hunting if you want my opinion no you're you're right i mean that and those dogs came into existence out of competition hunting it's not like right. pleasure hunters and hide hunters were breeding dogs to go two miles <laughs> Right. Especially like nowadays with tracking systems and side by sides, four wheelers and pickup trucks, like it's not a big a deal to some people because they can just watch the dog on a screen go two miles and then drive to him. Right. But like back in the day, like if if your dog would go that far, you're walking a lot. Yeah. That's a lot and that's another thing, like you said, man, the garments and everything, people need to just set that down listen to your dog and he'll teach you more than that Garmin will. I promise you. Yeah, that is good advice. Especially if you are going to, if you're going to compete and you need to know the intricacies of how that dog sounds and opens on different tracks, whether that be it's locate or you, I mean, anyone that's done this for any amount of time, they can tell how that dog's barking. If it's going to have a coon or not, sometimes like you can tell, like they're in a hole or on a fence or you can tell if they're right or not. That goes back to timing and not looking at that garment. Yeah. You know, that just is what it is. If you don't pay attention, how are you going to know? I don't know what your experience is with like the tree switch on those collars and stuff. Anytime I've used, used them, they, they don't work. Like if a dog's treed, it might show it's treed sometimes, but it's a good thing that they, they're not a hundred percent accurate because I think some people, they would just, they wouldn't even need to hear the dog bark. They would just completely go off what the Garmin says. Yeah. They were the ones you want to draw. <laughs> <laughs> if you put too much emphasis on that tracking system and reading your dog off of that, then you're missing, you're missing a lot, a lot of what's going on. You know, but that's kind of me and you talked about, you know, you coach football, and I used to coach football, and like game film, you know how we break it down, and you like to study that. That's kind of where I was when I was getting into competition hunting. I would drive all over and hunt with different people and just kind of, you know, watch what they did and how they trained and how they did this, and you can learn, you know, from different people and different things at work, and, you know, that don't involve a Garmin or doing this, doing that, just paying attention, you know, and think a lot of you know young hunters or people if you be a little more open-minded and be willing to learn and not think you're a know-it-all you can you know what i'm saying yeah no because there's there is a lot of older guys out there that will not turn down a request to go hunting with an inexperienced or new person or a young person so i mean there's and that's one of the biggest reasons why i do this is because there's for some reason with especially coon hunting and squirrel hunting with dogs, people tend to just promote themselves or their own product. And that's kind of, if they're in the media landscape, that's what they do. They just make it all about them. I try to capture stuff that people 30 to 50 years from now can look back on and they can see Ed Mead or Dick Brothers or these people that have hunted for 70 or 80 years and they did it before all the knowledge we have now like they figured it out on their own just them and a dog in the woods they didn't have facebook and some of them didn't have books and magazines back then to even go off of other than maybe like the full cry went back clear back into the 30s and 40s but i mean that was it still in 1930 or 2040 the dog that trees the most goons gonna win i promise <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and that's what I posting videos of that frogger pup and how he, he balls on tree. 
and mm-hmm. and people say, uh, I don't like that. I like chop. <laughs> I like chop mouth tree dogs. Oh, well, I don't care. It, I can hear that dog treed from six counties away, and he has a coon in the tree. <laughs> That's the name of the game. <laughs> yeah. I don't like that's great. Oh, his dad chopped and balled both on tree, and his dad won a world championship. So I don't. <laughs> if I wanted, right. if I wanted. If chopping on tree was most important to me, I would hunt like a feist or a cur, because some of those things can rattle <laughs> rattle barks off. I'm. Well, I promise you that guy complaining. If he hunts a little bit more, he'll realize that bone on the tree ain't his worst problem. I can promise. You. <laughs> yeah, it's just it, it's There's always a so. A whole fun. lot more things than nitpick. I know that's. It cracks me up because it's always like, it's people that have never had a dog or enough dogs to be able to be that picky. It's like, so the dog is consistently tree and coon, but you're not, you don't like it because it doesn't chop. I mean, that's just preference. But like I said, at the end of the day, if you're tree and coon and squalling, I'll, I'll walk to you. Yeah. You know, that's the way it should be. I mean, that goes back earlier, you know, just kind of being brainwashed or whatever we talking about. I mean, preference is fine. You know, whatever you like is fine. But at the end of the day, we still got a tree coon. Yeah, that's one of my the biggest things I see that kind of gets on my nerves on the internet is that gets completely ignored and glossed over. It's all <laughs> where does this dog come from? How does it open? How does it like all this? Like how how many coons does it tree when you turn it loose? How accurate is it? Like right. <laughs> that should be You're the most important. Yeah, that should be the most important thing is. When it trees, does it consistently have coon in it or not? Like that should be the number one thing. Not does it bark five times on the ground or six? Does it have an orange collar or a red collar? Yep, that's it, man. But you know, like we were talking about there, most sim guys asking them questions hardly hunt. Yeah. And you know, really, when they start saying that stuff, well, buddy, you're kind of telling on yourself. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. I ain't going to call you out on it. I kind of chuckle at myself, but you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, if you, if you do it long enough, when you find a good one that consistently puts coon in the trees, you don't care <laughs> what it is. Right. And you ain't going to nitpick that much. And that's, it's funny too, because like when I get together with all these different people, there's very rarely any of them that like stick to a single breed throughout their whole life. Like, right like a lot of the guys at hunt walkers that I've talked to and met, they started with blue ticks or English dogs or something. Like you, just like you said, I ain't partial to any breed. You know, if, if it's a winner and it's good, I, I'm happy. So, I think that's what keeps coon hunting so interesting for all of us. I mean, my goal every night is to tree more than I did last night. And just to watch that dog work and different spots, different opportunities that I, it's just a, it's fun for me. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's a, it's really an endless pursuit because you're developing an animal to do something. I don't know if there's something wrong with me or if something wrong with everyone else, but there's just, there's nothing like taking a dog to the woods and having them open on track for the first time. Or if you have a really loud dog, taking it out when it's dead calm and just hearing it blow up in the wood. There's nothing, nothing nothing like that. No, I like deer hunting. It is, awesome getting there first thing before it's even light out and seeing the sunrise and seeing all the animals wake up move around like that's beautiful but it's still it doesn't compare to 20 minutes to our eight hours (laughs) yeah the whole the whole process of like if if you get a dog from a puppy i mean you get that dog 12 weeks old all the memories and all the work and journey of getting that dog to where it's opening on track for the first time. I mean, that could be a year's worth of work finally starting to pay off. And then if you're going to compete, like there's, there's nothing like it. It's sad too, man. I don't, the young generations, a lot of people ain't hunting a whole lot anymore. And it's kind of sad to see really. Yeah. That's something has been brought up some. And I think, I don't know, I could be wrong, but since the fur market, is worthless i think back in the day a lot of people just hunted because it was a great source of extra income you could go out get some extra spend time with your friends i mean just kind of experience what we do now the way we do it now but there was a good financial incentive to do it so 
the people that maybe loved it 75% did it, but once they lost the financial incentive, they just kind of grew away from it. Where now, if you do it, you're not doing it for the money for the hides, that's for sure. You're doing it just because you love it. Yeah. So, yeah, at this point, you're losing money. Yeah. Yeah, dog food skyrocketing. Every, just the cost of everything in raising a dog is just through the roof. But that's like you said, man. You just got to love it. There's, you got to be a little – you have to have a screw loose and you have to really enjoy it. Yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> I still think, though, that if you – if you took a person out that enjoyed dogs, like I always thought, like if someone just completely just not experienced, doesn't even know what it is, if they love dogs, if you told them that there was an activity they could do that would be good exercise for them and their animal to do together and then took them out and let them listen to that dog work and do what it's bred to do, they would love to go do it. Like I just, I think a lot of people just don't have the exposure or opportunity. You yeah. know, like you said, with grandpa and everybody quit hunting, how many young kids actually even get to know about it? Yeah. I mean, that's same with, like you said, pups, any, any activity, if you don't have an opportunity to learn, you ain't going to. But I feel like recently it has become a little bit more popular online, at least to where there's right. like a higher awareness of it, where maybe 10 or 15 years ago before the internet really was as big as it is now most of the media and advertising and kind of the marketing behind hunting with dogs was all through magazines so then like people had literally unless they had a family member that would get one of the magazines they had no chance to be exposed to it where now it's i mean there's it's all over facebook and tiktok and stuff so hopefully that plays a positive role in the future and keeps people interested in it at least yeah i mean that they're the only hope that young generation don't get into the sport if it ceases to exist. It is crazy, man. I remember being young, you know, like I said, hunting with my uncles, you'd see 15, 20 dog boxes in town. And now if you see one or two, it's me or my brother. Yeah, <laughs> you that's know a, what I mean? That's just exactly it's, right. It's gone. Yeah. Yeah. It's never. Crazy how that worked. Yeah. It's exactly like that here, too. Used to be able to go outside at night, and if it was dark, you'd hear dogs treed in about every direction. And now the only thing, if me or my cousin, that's about the only people in this area doing it. That's the same way here. There's a there's a handful of buddies, but I mean, like I said, usually when we go hunting, we're all together anyway. So you never run into no one, it seems like. Yeah, which, I mean, it's kind of a blessing too, because <laughs> back then everyone killed 200 coon or so a season to <laughs> make money. And now no one's doing that, so... I know it's got me scratching my head, wondering where all these coons are at. Cause I ain't seen nothing. <laughs> well, this this people don't understand this time of year in this area. Uh, they they like going in holes and ditches and brush piles and in barns and stuff that you're not going to tree them in more than they do trees. That's what I love here. You know, you live in northwestern Indiana. There's coons everywhere. Come up here in December, buddy. Let's yeah. try. Yeah. You yeah, know. December or January or February. Yep. And some, not this year as much, but some years too, like in Ohio season comes in November 10th. So like some seasons you might get two or three nights of decent hunting before the weather just absolutely destroys the season. Yeah, that's a fact. Michigan, I know Michigan comes in in the end of October, so they usually have a little bit. I'm sure northern Michigan doesn't, but southern Michigan, they have a little bit more time to get some decent hunting in. But I've always said that Indiana needs to go in in October like that because just like you said, how many times in November is it a complete whiteout? <laughs> yeah, and especially now with the just people don't trap and there's not as many people coon hunting. So, I mean, it, I don't think it's going to hurt the population any. And I'm sure most guys, if even if that happened – they're not going to just go out and slaughter them like crazy either. They'll just give them an opportunity. Like if you have a young dog going, you can take them out and knock them one out in October. Right. You can take them out when it would be best for the pups if you can get a young dog out in October when the weather's still good and they're moving and knocks them out to them. Setting them up to be successful. You know yeah. what I mean? The opportunities there. <laughs> Instead of beating their heads into a den tree when it's five degrees below zero. 
wait to January and we got to walk the snow up to our ass and kill something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. And yet we still do it. Yeah. <laughs> we ain't figured it out yet, but we're going to still keep trucking along. Yeah. I guess. We'll still be out there. <laughs> yeah, I think we covered about everything under the moon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, I hope people, I enjoyed it. I hope they find it interesting. Yeah. I'm sure they will. We talked to about a lot of different topics. Right. Like, like I said to me, buddy, if we can't have a good time, we ain't going to do it. <laughs> yeah. That's the way it should be. Well, it was nice to get to talk to Eric, and I hope I can get together with him and go hunting soon. And I really hope you're liking these podcasts, and I hope you're liking my videos. And I really look forward to sharing it all with you, and I'll talk to you next time. He ended up treeing seven-tenths of a mile. I had my light on coming in, and he had another coon, so. Turned him loose three times, he had three coons. Ah, 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 ah.